All right, let's talk about protecting your fruit from birds and bugs and larger animals. So I use these things a lot to protect the individual fruits and there's a couple things you can use. These are called foot socks. They're just basically a small nylon stocking that they give you to put on your foot when you're trying on shoes so you don't leave your nasty fungus behind for the next person or pick up someone else's nasty fungus. And uh, they work pretty good. I just wrap them real quick around the fruit and I usually don't even tie them off. You can kind of tie a quick overhand knot on the side. I usually just kind of wrap it around the stem like the leftover stuff. And as long as it stays on there, that's good enough. The birds will kind of peck at them a little bit and sample them, but they rarely will do a lot of damage except for maybe to a few fruits. People also use these to prevent insects from laying their eggs like codling moth and stuff like that. I don't have a high codling moth population here probably because my chickens are always uh, patrolling and cleaning up the dropped fruit. The other thing people use and that I've tried before is a paper bag. So you just take a really small paper bag, slip it over the fruit and staple the side real quick. Um, they're harder to put on, they take longer to put on, they're probably less reusable. I can reuse these at least for two seasons. And um, the good side is that they're biodegradable. You know, I don't really like this whole disposable culture thing. I always feel bad buying these things. Seedling apples that I've spent all this time growing like a new tree from seed. And then, you know, I wanna get it to fruit and try it. And it always starts with just a few fruits the first year. And I really wanna protect those. Varieties that I've grafted that maybe are only producing fruit for the first time, like this is Tideman's Red. I've probably never had a Tideman's Red apple. I don't remember ever getting any because the birds would wipe them out real early. It's an early variety, it's already getting pretty large. This whole tree is an early tree, like with grafted different early varieties. Like for instance, the base tree is Gravenstein, and I almost never get a Gravenstein. The birds start eating it really early and they're just finished before the apples are actually really ripe. If you have a really high bug pressure or really, really high bird pressure, not that many fruits, you're, you're not gonna get any fruit unless you do something. As far as birds go, if it's an invasive, uh, kind of nasty invasive species like starlings here in America, I'll just shoot them. Uh, last time I had a group of starlings come in here, maybe like uh, six or eight of them, and like immediately the first day I shot four or five of them because I was just, I wanted to just wipe them out so they don't go and bring back their, you know, starling, thousand starling buddies from down in the valley where they're real common. But yeah, don't be a, a dick and, you know, wipe, just like shoot a bunch of random, unknown, wild native birds because they're eating a few of your apples. Like most species, that might do a little bit of damage. There's not going to be that many of them. You can absorb that damage. For larger animals, um, I'll get raccoons and possums are a pretty big problem. And I'll shoot those. Both of them are actually pretty good to eat. They're traditional, you know, food in some areas. I know a lot of people think that's weird, but to me it's weird uh, to think that they're not food. Possum is actually quite good if you prepare it well and it's not, you know, some ultra old tough specimen or something like that. I also use these traps if you want to trap them live or you don't want to run out in the middle of the night in your skivvies to shoot them. You can use these kind of like uh, live trap type things where there's a, a trap door that closes. This isn't my favorite one. I have several but you know it works and those work pretty good. Most of the animals are incautious enough like raccoons and possums to walk right in there and get caught. I think these work pretty good as, as much as I prefer not to buy them and contribute to uh, more landfill in this kind of disposable culture, but uh, they work. Okay, let's talk about uh, squirrels for a minute. My squirrels aren't a problem. I don't know why, but the, my western gray squirrels just don't bother the apples. They're busy with green bay nuts, green acorns, just about anything but green apples. However, I know friends in the area that have problems with them. And all the time on like fruit forums and stuff, they discuss squirrels and problems with squirrels continually. So it is a real problem for some people I know. Check out uh, growingfruit.org. There's a good thread there on uh, trapping and killing squirrels and squirrel problems. There's all kinds of different traps and stuff that people use. Uh, for me, if I have a problem with a squirrel, I'm going to shoot it, but I don't, but I hunt them anyway, so I can give you some insight on that. This is what I use. It's a 22 caliber air rifle. Uh, this one is a Benjamin Discovery, which is a pretty affordable but accurate rifle, and it's the type that you charge up. I forget that, what it's called, but there's a little meter on the bottom that tells you how charged it is 
and you take an air tank or a pump, you can get a pump with it. The pump's very expensive though. And you fill this and charge this chamber with air and then you get a bunch of shots out of it. Like I probably get uh, 15 accurate shots or something like that before I have to refill it. And there's other advantages to this type versus the pump type. But the pump types are usually cheaper. But this is a pretty affordable air chamber type. Um, this has been a great investment. I think it's a really good investment for a lot of uh, homesteads. Also, if you're kind of... You know, you're kind of near other people, like maybe a large suburban tracts or something like that. Um, you might get away with using something like this, and it's much, much safer. Don't, don't, don't think that it's completely safe. It's actually pretty deadly. But say compared to a 22 long rifle round, it's uh, you know much safer. So it's safer to have around kids. Like something you might not think of is if uh, you're shooting uh, something out of your tree and you miss and hit a branch like this is going to do less damage to your tree they're also quieter so this isn't loaded but it's charged and uh, this is actually a silencer and i i would actually recommend getting the silencer that's some noise and it's going to startle you know animals and stuff but it doesn't startle them nearly as much so you, like if you have a flock of birds or something you're more likely to get you know a couple of birds before they take off which uh, with something like starlings is important. I mean, there's a limit to what they can kill, but I, you know, I use it for hunting small game and turkeys with headshots, and uh, these are great. So I would recommend getting a scope, though. Like you really aren't going to do that good without a scope. With good pellets, I can pretty, in a, you know, on a bench rest in a controlled environment, I can easily get uh, three quarter inch groups at 30 yards, which is pretty good for hunting small game. Uh, people use even this gun to hunt. Um, you know, ground squirrels and stuff at long range. So one problem is that if you have, uh, if you're in a state with a lead ban, like California has a lead ban now, and which I'm for, I know a lot of people don't like it. I, I'm generally in favor of the lead ban, but it's really hard to get uh, a non-lead pellet that shoots decent out of this. So hopefully the ban will drive development of better uh, non-lead ammunition in general yeah so like i said that's uh that's been a really great investment for the homestead i've used it uh just so much just for hunting a shotgun's more like kind of point in, sh in the general direction and shoot and you're probably going to kill whatever you're shooting at but you don't really want to fire a shotgun even like a 410 into your you know fruit tree because you're <laughs> the point is to save the fruit you know not fill it full of shot yeah i think this is a much better option and um, it's cheap too it's cheap to shoot i forgot i was going to mention deer because uh i know someone's going to ask me about deer this is really about protecting fruit not not your trees but uh, someone's going to ask me so deer i mean you pretty much gotta fence them out the only real option that i know of other than that that's really viable you know like really practical is having a dog on patrol 24 seven, you know, a dog that's really gonna do its job and just keep those keep those guys away. Other than that, you just gotta fence them out. Some areas it's easy, some it's hard. I live here, my fences are totally janky because they're all temporary, you know, I haven't done any permanent fencing. Even if it's less than six feet tall, they just won't jump over it and they don't try that hard to get into the gardens and stuff. My friends, maybe uh, 10 miles away over here, the deer are just ravenous to get in the garden. They'll, they'll jump really high. Sometimes they'll jump and they'll, they'll get a leg caught in the fence and they'll hang there. And uh, they had one, they said they wouldn't have believed it if they didn't actually see it for themselves, that it was a small deer too that kicked its way, like kicked its way through welded wire and broke the wire and, and got into the garden. I have used individual fences a lot on trees, like if there's a tree that's kind of remote and I, it's not in a larger fenced area. I've actually done that a lot. I'll put in like four, you know, regular T fence posts and just wrap some fencing around it that's, you know, maybe five feet high or something. So they, it's small enough inside that they can't jump into it and they can't reach over into it either and that works pretty good. Although it's quite a pain in the butt to have to do it, but what are you going to do? Unless you train your trees carefully, you know, cage them for a while until you get them up really high, then uh, you're going to have a problem. One other thing they'll do, though, is even if the tree is tall enough that they can't get it, if it's of a certain size, they might use it to rub their antlers on. If there's some isolated tree with a long, bare stem, they're just going to go right to that and, and use it to mark their territory and rub, rub their antlers in a, on it and tear off all the bark and kill it or mess it up. Okay, that's that.